Story 6. The Half-Closed Eyes of the Buddha and the Slowly Sinking Sun By Shankar Lamakane Summary The Half-Closed Eyes of the Buddha and the Slowly Sinking Sun, written by Shankar Lamakane, presents an unconventional narrative approach, focusing on the inner monologues of two characters, a foreign tourist and a local Nepali tourist guide in the Kathmandu Valley. This unique story issues traditional action-based storytelling in favor of delving into the character's thoughts and experiences using a stream-of-consciousness technique. The story opens with a confident female tourist who boasts an in-depth understanding of Nepal, surpassing even the guide's knowledge. Having grown up amidst plains, mountains, and the sea, she relishes the tranquility and natural aroma of the lush green valley in Kathmandu. The captivating allure of the Swayambu Temple's Buddha statue, with its half-closed eyes, evokes a sense of calm within her. The tourist appreciates the cultural contributions of the East, including ancient tools and writings etched onto palm leaves and copper plate inscriptions. The narrative shifts as the guide begins to share insights with the tourist. He recounts the legend of Manjushri's sword strike at Chobhar, which allowed for the settlement of the Kathmandu Valley. Delving into culinary delights, the guide introduces the concept of momo, a beloved traditional dish, and recalls his grandmother narrating the tale of brikuti while indulging in hookah. The focus then transitions to the guide's inner thoughts. Standing atop Chobhar Hill, he weaves the historical account of its formation by Manjushri's sword, an integral part of the valley's lore. During their return journey, they pause before a house that starkly starkly contrasts with the tourists' prior experiences. The house serves as a poignant reminder of life's diverse realities. Within, they encounter a child afflicted by polio, rendering him immobile. The child's gaze, akin to the Samyak gaze, symbolizes an Eastern quality, the ability to endure silence and stillness without complaint. In a moment of deception, the guide falsely claims to be a doctor, evoking elation from the child's parents who interpret her as a potential savior. Their expressions reflect intimacy, kindness, and gratitude. The guide showcases the child's healthy sister, emphasizing her ability to engage in age-appropriate activities. The contrasting sparkle in the paralyzed child's eyes as he watches his sister reinforces the harsh realities he faces. Amidst these musings, the guide perceives a welcoming warmth in the tourist's eyes, a veil concealing the enigma of life's eventual end. He likens her eyes to the exquisite reflection of the setting sun in the Buddha's eyes, mirroring the beauty and transience inherent in existence. The half-closed eyes of the Buddha and the slowly sinking sun captivates readers through its introspective narrative, steering away from typical plot progression. By exploring the inner worlds of the characters, the story delves into their perceptions of the Kathmandu Valley's beauty, history, contrasts, and the profundities of human experience. This unconventional approach allows readers to contemplate the layers of meaning woven into the interplay between sight, history, and the essence of life. Understanding the text Answer the following questions. How does the tourist describe his initial impression of the Kathmandu Valley? The tourist's initial impression of the Kathmandu Valley is one of profound beauty and vivid imagery. The valley's landscape is characterized by neatly arranged rectangles, dotted with clay homes adorned in vibrant hues of red, yellow, and white. The scent of earth and mountains permeates the atmosphere, immersing the senses in a unique sensory experience. This environment exudes an old-fashioned serenity that captivates the tourist's senses, transporting them to a realm untouched by the frenetic pace of modern life. The picturesque blend of colors, scents, and tranquility weaves a tapestry of sensory delight, inviting the tourist to connect with the valley's natural essence. B. According to the tourist, why is the West indebted to the East? The tourist posits that the West owes a debt of gratitude to the East due to the valuable cultural contributions that have flowed from the East to the West. This indebtedness stems from the East's provision of diverse cultural treasures such as Puranas, ancient narratives of myths and legends, brass figures reflecting artistic finesse, and intricate ivory decorations showcasing craftsmanship. Furthermore, the East's contribution of palm-leaf manuscripts and copper-plate inscriptions has preserved historical knowledge and intellectual traditions. Through these offerings, the East has enriched the West's understanding of history, art, and heritage. This reciprocal exchange of cultural artifacts 
artifacts signifies the interconnectedness of civilizations and emphasizes how the West benefits from the multifaceted legacy bestowed upon it by the East. See, how does the tourist interpret the gaze of the monks and nuns? The tourist's interpretation of the gaze of monks and nuns is founded upon their distinctive appearance. The tourist articulates that encountering the Samyak gaze, which translates to a right or correct gaze, is a rare feat. This perspective suggests that monks and nuns possess a unique ability to see the world unadulterated by biases or distractions. The Samyak look embodies a pure form of sight, allowing them to perceive reality without contamination from personal prejudices or external influences. This interpretation underscores the monks and nuns' dedication to transcending mundane distractions and attaining a state of clarity that grants them the capacity to perceive the world in its unfiltered and authentic state. D. Why do the tourists think Nepali people are wonderful and exceptional? The tourists hold the belief that Nepali people are extraordinary and praiseworthy due to their distinctive way of life. This conviction is primarily rooted in the architectural marvel of Nepali homes, which resemble temple-like structures. These houses are adorned with an array of intricate ornamentations and artistic styles, brought to life through the skillful use of a chisel. The tourists perceive the embodiment of devotion and craftsmanship in these wooden creations, mirroring the devotion found in temples. The harmony of design and the mellifluous rhythm of the chisel chisels work evoke a sense of wonderment, reflecting the Nepali people's unique ability to infuse artistry and spiritual resonance into their everyday living spaces. This interpretation aligns their cultural practices with a sense of awe, making the Nepali people stand out as remarkable and exceptional. E. What are the different kinds of communities in the Kathmandu Valley and how do they coexist with each other? The Kathmandu Valley is a melting pot of diverse communities, attracting individuals from various corners of the world. It serves as a convergence point for an assortment of ethnicities, encompassing Aryans, non-Aryans, Hindus, and Buddhists. The valley's significance as a sacred land draws these disparate groups, providing them a common ground for connection. This shared spiritual reverence fosters an environment where different races and belief systems can harmoniously coexist. The valley's allure as a destination for rebirth resonates with individuals seeking spiritual growth and renewal, transcending the boundaries of culture and religion. The coexistence of these communities is facilitated by the overarching thread of reverence for the Holy Land, transcending differences and harmonizing the diverse tapestry of people that populate the Kathmandu Valley. F. What does the tourist feel about the Temple of Adhanath? The tourist holds a sense of awe and admiration for the Temple of Adhanath in the Kathmandu Valley. The temple stands as a remarkable testament to the coexistence of diverse beliefs. Amidst the presence of a Shiva shrine, the temple boasts an array of Buddha statues and multiple prayer wheels adorned with the sacred mantra Om Mani Padmi Hum. This confluence of deities and symbols embodies the ethos of Nepali tolerance and harmony. Visitors, unburdened by concerns over individual gods, faiths, or ideologies, experience a carefree joy as they engage in playful activities on the temple grounds. The Temple of Adhanath becomes a visual representation of how people from various backgrounds can peacefully and joyfully share a sacred space, transcending religious differences and embracing the beauty of coexistence. G. Why does the guide take the tourist to the remote village? The guide's decision to lead the tourist to a remote village stems from a profound intention to unveil the realities of life that may be unfamiliar to the tourist. By introducing the tourist to a severely disabled child hailing from an impoverished family, the guide seeks to provide a stark contrast to the tourist's experiences. This encounter serves as an opportunity to enlighten the tourist about the challenges faced by individuals who exist on the fringes of society, a reality that might remain hidden from the tourist's usual perspective. In doing so, the guide endeavors to foster compassion and empathy within the tourist's perception of the beautiful country. By revealing this aspect of life, the guide aims to offer a more comprehensive understanding of the nation, showcasing its compassionate spirit alongside its physical beauty. H. What does the innocent village couple think of the doctor? The innocent village couple, influenced by the guide's falsehood, wholeheartedly believes that the tourist is a doctor. Unaware of the deception, they perceive the tourist as their eldest son, imbued with the ability to bring a life-reviving remedy from distant shores. 
This imagined restorative elixir from the seven seas becomes a symbol of hope and healing, embodying the couple's faith in their son's capabilities. Their eyes brim with intimacy, kindness, and profound gratitude, reflecting the depth of their trust in the tourist's role as a compassionate healer. The couple's genuine acceptance of the tourist as their son who has undertaken this life-saving mission underscores the power of belief and the human capacity for empathy, casting a poignant light on the guide's ruse and the unexpected connections it has forged. I, what are the differences between the paralyzed child and his sister? The paralyzed child and his sister share a striking contrast in their physical abilities. While they exhibit similarities, such as their familial bond, a fundamental difference exists between their capacities. The paraplegic child's body is constrained, limiting his movement to only one organ, the eyes. This singular mobility emphasizes his immobility and the challenges he faces due to his condition. In contrast, his sister possesses a fully functioning body. She showcases a wide range of physical capabilities, including speech, crawling, and engaging in playful interactions with her surroundings and peers. This juxtaposition underscores the profound disparity between their experiences and highlights the sister's ability to engage with the world, setting her apart from her paralyzed sibling. Their unique circumstances poignantly capture the complexities of life, celebrating the sister's vitality while drawing attention to the challenges faced by the paraplegic child. J. Why does the guide show the instances of poverty to the tourist? Motivated by the allure of the Sumyak stare and the picturesque landscape, the guide deliberately exposes the tourist to instances of poverty in order to impart a holistic understanding of the country's essence. By showing the tourist the Sumyak look, a gaze devoid of self-expression, the guide aims to convey a profound yet unspoken aspect of the human experience. Simultaneously, he directs the tourist's attention towards the coexisting beauty that lacks alternative expressions. In presenting the contrasts within the country's richness, the guide seeks to unveil the shadow side that resides alongside its splendor. By showcasing poverty, he provides a nuanced perspect perspective, revealing the complex layers of life and emotion that form an integral part of the nation's tapestry. This deliberate juxtaposition invites the tourist to delve beneath the surface, appreciating both the luminous and the obscured facets of the country's reality. Reference to the context A uh, which narrative technique is used by the author to tell the story? How is this story different from other stories you have read? The author, Shankar Lamakain, employs the narrative technique of stream of consciousness in presenting the story of the half-closed eyes of the Buddha and the slowly sinking Sunday. This technique involves delving into the uninterrupted flow of the character's thoughts, sensory experiences, memories, and inner monologues. Unlike traditional narratives, this story's distinction lies in its utilization of the stream of consciousness method to reveal the character's perspectives. Rather than depicting actions and events, the story delves into the character's introspections, capturing their innermost musings. Moreover, this story diverges from conventional narratives by presenting the viewpoints of two characters solely through their thoughts, offering an intimate exploration of their minds. This distinctive approach aligns with the character's introspective journeys, making the half-closed eyes of the Buddha and the slowly sinking sun stand out among the stories that primarily focus on external events and dialogues. B. How is the author able to integrate two fragments of the narration into a unified whole? In The Half-Closed Eyes of Buddha and the Slowly Sinking Sun, the author adeptly melds two fragments of narration into a cohesive whole by employing recurring motifs and thematic connections. He achieves this by weaving instances of eyes and linking them to two distinct realms, the realm of farmers and traditional beliefs. The author skillfully interconnects these fragments with vivid descriptions of the local neighborhood and its inhabitants' livelihoods. As the guide accompanies the tourist on a journey, their narratives are intricately intertwined through the guide's utilization of the stream of consciousness technique. The repeated references to eyes and the narrative me methods employed to depict various locations and activities unify the seemingly disparate worlds of the East and the West. Through this narrative approach, the author prompts readers to embrace a broader perspective and discern the deeper significance that binds these two worlds together. See, the author brings some historical and legendary references in the story. Collect these references and show their significance in the story. 
Shankar Lamakane skillfully weaves historical and mythical references throughout the half-closed eyes of the Buddha and the slowly sinking sun, underlining Nepal's significance. The story showcases Nepal's rich cultural heritage by invoking Puranas, exemplifying the Nepalese people's profound connection to their own culture. References to brass and ivory representations, manuscripts on palm leaves, and copper plate inscriptions underscore Nepal's diverse cultural fabric. The narrative intertwines Manjushri's role in Kathmandu Valley's settlement through his sword strike at Chobhar, which unleashed the Bagmati River's flow. The Adinath Temple symbolizes Nepal's tolerance and unity, magnifying their significance. Buddhism's presence surfaces with shaven monks and nuns representing the Samyat gaze, seeing reality without distortion. Historical ties emerge through Princess Brakuti and King Amshavarma, linking Nepal to neighboring Tibet. Nepal, depicted as a Buddhist haven, emanates hope and tranquility, mirrored by the sunset's radiant reflection in the Buddha's eyes. Through these references, Lamakane imparts Nepal's historical depth, cultural richness, and spiritual essence, elevating the story beyond its narrative scope. D. The author talks about the eyes in many places, the eyes of the shaven monks and nuns, eyes in the window and door panels, the eyes of the Himalayas, the eyes of the paralyzed boy, the eyes of the welcoming villagers and above all the half-closed eyes of the Buddha. Explain how all the instances of eyes contribute to the overall unity of the story. In Shankar Lamakane's narrative, the slowly sinking sun and Buddha's half-closed eyes, the recurrent motif of eyes serves to weave a tapestry of unity throughout the story. The reference to the Samyak gaze, embodied by the monks and nuns' eyes, signifies perceiving reality authentically. This thematic thread connects the diverse instances of eyes, imbuing the narrative with a sense of cohesion. The eyes of various entities, the Himalayas, the paralyzed boy, the welcoming villagers, symbolize unique facets of culture, religion, beauty, and Buddhism's legacy. These references mirror people's yearnings and memories, highlighting their inner visions and emotional depths. The eyes depicted in carved lattice windows and painted entrance panels capture the essence of a country shaped by its rich history. As the narrative gathers momentum, the eyes represent more than just physical organs, they embody the essence of a nation, revealing its culture and civilization. Ultimately, the half-closed eyes of the Buddha encapsulate the story's core. These references to eyes resonate as a collective symbol, underlining Nepal's identity and its guardianship under the watchful gaze of Buddha, uniting the story's diverse elements into a singular, impactful whole. Reference Beyond the Text I'll write an essay on living proximity to nature. Living in proximity to nature. Nature, in all its breathtaking grandeur, holds an indispens indispensable role in our lives. From the air we breathe to the water we drink, the animals that inhabit the earth, the warmth of the sun, and the serenity of the moonlit nights, nature is an intricate tapestry that sustains our existence. This dynamic interplay of life forms and elements, often taken for granted, is at the core of life's delicate equilibrium on our planet. Within the embrace of nature, an intricate web of relationships thrives. Animals, insects, and fish find their sustenance and shelter within its realms. Nature offers us more than the material, it provides a harmonious environment where life can flourish. As human beings, we are fundamentally linked to nature in a myriad of ways. We rely on it for our most basic needs, sustenance, water, shelter, and even clothing. Nature's resources not only fuel our survival but also provide the foundation for our prosperity. The vibrant hues that adorn nature's canvas showcase its inherent diversity. The varied landscapes, from the verdant forests to the azure skies and towering mountains, form an ever-changing backdrop to life's unfolding drama. In nature, the dance of living and non-living entities coalesces to create a symphony that resonates across the globe. Our profound interdependence with nature is apparent in every facet of life. The rhythm of our lives aligns with the rising and setting of the sun, the changing of seasons, and the flow of water. From the food on our plates to the air we breathe, nature envelopes us in its nurturing embrace. It offers boundless energy sources and the potential for sustainable practices like organic farming. The wisdom gleaned from nature's intricate systems holds the keys to innovative solutions for a harmonious coexistence. However, the delicate balance that sustains life on Earth is in 
increasingly threatened by human activities. To preserve this vital relationship, a global collective effort is required. The imperative to reduce environmental stress, restore equilibrium, and ensure the well-being of future generations is undeniable. In this pursuit, the three R's reduce, reuse, and recycle assume greater significance. By minimizing our ecological footprint, repurposing materials, and recycling to create anew, we can pave the way for a more sustainable future. Embracing green technologies, advocating for conservation, and championing environmental awareness can contribute to nurturing the connection that binds us to nature. Living in proximity to nature is not just a choice, it is a responsibility. The intricate web of life is fragile, and our actions today will reverberate across time. It is our duty to tread lightly upon this earth, to safeguard the natural world that sustains us, and to foster a harmonious coexistence with all living beings. In preserving nature's sanctity, we secure our own well-being and that of generations yet to come. B. The story talks about ethnic-slash-religious coexistence of different communities in Nepal, where the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Aryans and non-Aryans have lived in communal harmony for ages. In your view, how have the Nepali people been able to live in such harmony? Ethnic and Religious Coexistence in Nepal Nepal, with its rich cultural tapestry woven from diverse ethnicities and religious beliefs, stands as a testament to the extraordinary ability of its people to coexist harmoniously. The short tale, The Half-Closed Eyes of the Buddha and the Slowly Sinking Sun encaps encapsulates the enduring communal harmony that has characterized Nepal for centuries. Several key factors contribute to this remarkable coexistence, rooted in historical, cultural, political, and topographical dimensions. Historically, Nepal's unique landscape played a pivotal role in forging a sense of shared identity. Nestled within the Himalayan ranges, the nation's geographical isolation fostered a sense of unity among its inhabitants. This isolation also acted as a buffer against external pressures that could have led to domination by any single ethnic or religious group. As a result, no single community could impose its spiritual system onto others, enabling diverse traditions to flourish side by side. Cultural pluralism is another cornerstone of Nepal's harmonious coexistence. The country's rich tapestry of cultures and traditions is woven with threads from Aryans, non-Aryans, Buddhists, and Hindus, among others. Each community reveres its own deities while also acknowledging shared ones. This overlapping spirituality engenders mutual respect and understanding, allowing individuals to celebrate both personal and collective religious practices. Nepal's political landscape has also contributed to this unity. The country's constitution declares Nepal as a secular nation, ensuring the freedom of religion for its citizens. This constitutional framework guarantees that no one belief system is favored over another, promoting a sense of fairness and equal standing for all communities. In addition, Nepal's political history is characterized by a mosaic of rulers who recognized the importance of cultural diversity. These rulers sought to maintain a harmonious balance among different religious and ethnic groups, bolstering inter-community respect. Furthermore, the topographical diversity of Nepal fosters a sense of inter interconnectedness among its inhabitants. The nation's various landscapes, from the plains of Terai to the mountains of the Himalayas, have shaped distinct yet interdependent ways of life. This mutual reliance encourages cooperation and unity among communities. Nepal's enduring ethnic and religious coexistence is a testament to the intricate interplay of historical, cultural, political, and topographical factors. The absence of a dominant majority, cultural openness, constitutional secularism, and geographical influences have nurtured an environment where diverse communities thrive in harmony. As the tale aptly highlights, Nepal stands as a shining example of how mutual respect and the celebration of diverse beliefs can foster enduring communal unity. Best of luck.